Well, we are here with Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, which is pretty awesome. And we are here in the in the ceremonial room outside the Speaker's office, where apparently they sign bills and have heads of state, which uh, I, I'm sure you're honored to be here with me. I, uh, but <laughs> I am. Good to have you. Good to have you, Ben. Welcome. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. it. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot to talk about. Obviously, the elections are coming up. And uh, first, let me get your thoughts on, on where you think things are going to head. Um, you know, it's, it's a long ways away. I feel good about our chances. Uh, midterm elections are hard on the majority party. Midterm elections for a president first midterm, on average, you lose like 32 seats. We've got a 24 seat majority. So just clearly with the headwind of history in front of us, that's not a good thing. But I feel like we're going to have a tailwind of accomplishments to get us into the midterms. Uh, we can get into the, all the agenda, but we've done so many things in such a short period of time that will actually made a positive difference in people's lives. And I think we're going to have a really good story to tell, not to mention the fact that our candidates, our members are battle hardened. They know how to run tough, tough races. So I feel very, very good about where we are. So I want to start by talking about some of those accomplishments, and then I want to get to sort of the, the tactics that, that you guys are going to use in, in, the, uh, in the election campaign. Yeah. So obviously, you know, the, the top of the list for accomplishments is the tax bill, right. and Democrats losing their minds That's over right. the tax bill did not look particularly good. So it, it's fair to point to Nancy Pelosi saying that you've given the American people crumbs that's and say right. that that's, that's wrong. So how much do you think that'll impact you? That's election? going to be the gift that keeps giving, just, <laughs> just, that, just that statement. But every single Democrat voted against this. Uh, I really think they did that because they thought they were going to psych us into defeating ourselves, particularly in the Senate. And when they kept pushing this line, they went so far left, so hard progressive, that every single Democrat voted against it. They're on the wrong side of history, and they're, they're on the wrong side of results. Mm -hmm. I've been working on this issue a long time. And basically, we have, this is bigger than 1986 tax reform. So this is the first time in 31 years we've done tax reform. But it's much more profound than the tax reform we did back then in 1986. Because this completely changes the way we tax ourselves on an international competitive basis. And this will put such a strong foundation of growth and opportunity and free enterprise in America, more so than any kind of economic reform in, in my lifetime. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And so they're on the wrong side of history. Uh, this takes a tax system that was the worst in the industrialized world and gives us a tax system that we think is in the top three of the industrialized world's tax systems. That means more jobs in America, more opportunity in America, businesses coming back to America, bringing capital back to America, expanding, and that is a phenomenally good thing. It's gonna give more careers, better wages, better benefits, more entrepreneurship, and the Democrats are against all of that. Well, one of the things that's, that's really difficult in the job that you have, Mr. Speaker, is obviously that uh, you are forced to do, po I mean, your job is to do policy. Yeah. But at the same time, it seems to me that elections are very little about policy these days. And they seem to be much more about uh, different moral stances and maybe, we hope, a battle of ideas. Right. Uh, how, how do you plan on tackling that? Yeah. Because you know we can talk about our policies being great right. all day long. Right. If, right. if good policy won, Republicans would never lose. Um, but, the, but the problem is, obviously, that it, particularly if you look at the polls among young people, they're really, really egregiously bad. I mean, 70% yeah. of my audience is under the age of 35, uh, and the polls, even among conservative youngsters about Republicans, are not good. How are you going to win yeah. the battle of ideas when, when you're so focused on talking policy? And is know, there a way to shift That's always that? been my issue. Uh, I've always strongly believed that elections need to be about choices and about ideas. And that's why in 2016, I got our House Republicans together to come up with an agenda and to run on it. We called it the better way so that we would have a game plan. We would give the country a very clear choice and that if we won the election, we would have earned the right to put that agenda in place. We're two thirds of the way from doing through doing that right now. And that gives us a, a good story to tell, which is here's what we said we would do. Here's what we did. This is what we did in Wisconsin, by the way, in 2010. Uh, the state legislature, our governor. It's a model that I, I believe in, that I saw work there. It's something we're trying to apply here nationally. And then we also have to go with new ideas in the election um, to, to continue this, this reform agenda, to disrupt it. Now, the point you made, I think, is important. But what about young people? The, the thing that bothers me the most, and I know you've, you've talked about this a bit, is identity politics. I hate identity politics. It's wrong. It's morally wrong. But also, it's insidious. And it's, and it's practiced on both sides. Our job is to reject identity politics and try and replace it with better ideas and idea and aspirational politics. I'm a Jack Kemp acolyte. I'm a big believer 
in using our core founding principles, applying them to the problems and show that there's solutions for everybody. And that to me is the kind of an agenda and temperament we have to have going into the 2018 elections. And, and so I wanted to ask you about that specifically, not in terms of you know efficiencies and economics, but about the moral differences that you see between yeah. right and left. Because I think these that's, right. that, that's the root issue, particularly for young people. Because yeah. you know you and I are both uh, big fans. Obviously, you long before before I was, and and uh, in much more prominent way. But you're big on entitlement reform. Yeah. Entitlement right. reform right. is uh, obviously a difficult thing to sell to a bunch of 17 year olds who never think they will be 60. Right? You never. Yeah. There's not a 17 year old in America who, who cares about their social security because they're never going to be, be of age to receive That's it. Right. Uh, and so you know, this, when, when I speak to young people, which I do on a regular basis, uh, it seems to me that what they really want to hear is about this moral differentiation. So in your view, moving below sort of the, the top of the iceberg in politics, moving below the water level, what do you think is the big distinction between right and left in American politics that needs to be elucidated? Yeah, we believe in equality of opportunity. They believe in equality of outcome. Equality of opportunity means we want to make sure that we use these guiding principles that built this country, liberty, freedom, free enterprise, self-determination, government by consent, which gives you an open economy, which gives you freedom, which gives you the ability to, to chart your life the way you want to. And we strive to promote equality of opportunity so that the most people can get the most opportunities possible. And nowhere else is that ever made more clear than a free enterprise system than a freedom democratic capitalism like we have, like our system is a, a built on natural rights. What, what the left believes in, and look, you're asking a conservative what the left believes in, but they believe in equality of outcome. The difference in the kind and size and role of government you have between what we're saying and what they're saying is enormous. Having an equality of outcome agenda means elites in Washington, unelected bureaucrats, micromanage our lives and, our, and everything we do in such a way that they believe they have to decide how our, how, what the results of our lives are. That's very different. That's the sense of equality, which is they make things equal in the end and the outcome of things. That gives you a stagnant society. That gives you a top-down society. That gives you, this is, I come from Wisconsin, which is the birthplace of the, of the Progressive Party. They believe in all this early 20th century progressivism and Hegel and Bismarck and all these guys who basically think that we're all rubes and dubes and we don't know enough, so we need to delegate our power to these, these, uh, these smart bureaucrats that are insulated from elections so they can harmonize and micromanage our lives. And that is an equality of outcome philosophy. It's antithetical to our founding philosophy. And that, at the end of the day, is the big difference here. And so the fights we have up here, in many cases, not everyone, but in many cases, are fights of that origin. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, I've, I've been watching, obviously, your political ascent for my entire life because, uh, <laughs> yeah, because I'm younger. So feel um, but, <laughs> but certainly over the last, uh, you know, 15 years. And one of the things that uh, I wish that you had the opportunity to speak more about that stuff. I know. Because it seems uh, like you're sucked more into speaking about the efficiency Yeah, outcomes. I'm in the day job. Yeah, right. Exactly, right. Yeah, no, exactly. Because we do need thought leaders in the, in the conservative movement who are talking specifically about the roots of the left and yeah. talking specifically about the, the way that natural rights have been overcome by a different regime of how rights are thought about, right? The difference yeah. between positive and negative rights. Yeah, right. So when I go to, I, I talk to schools all the time, young people, I always say, look, these are our rights given to us pre-government. You don't even have to believe in God to believe that mm -hmm. they come from God. They're pre-government. So government can't take those away from us. That's us. That's We're sovereign. I don't even like the idea of negative versus positive. That's more of a mm -hmm. left construct. But the idea of government granted rights means we give our power to the government I always say the healthcare debate. Everybody says healthcare is a right. If you buy into that premise, then we're saying we're giving our power to our government to tell us how, when, where, and under what circumstances we get to exercise that right. We're giving the government way too much power than we should. That's what the left is saying when they say they want to grant us these new rights. The best thing that I've found when I talk to young crowds is um, if we do not get entitlements under control, which we can with more choice and competition and free enterprise and choice, if we don't get these things under control, we are going to bankrupt the next generation. Mm -hmm. We've run the federal government, I round the numbers, we've run the federal government um, for the last 60 years by taking about 20 cents out of every dollar made in America, produced in America to pay for the federal government. If we do nothing, add no new programs, do nothing, by the time my kids are having kids, we're going to have to take 40 cents out of every single dollar made in America to pay for this government at that time mm -hmm. before they even get on to doing something else they want to do with their government. So we will bankrupt the next generation. I actually had the CBO run numbers years ago on what tax rates would have to be. It goes up as high as 88% mm -hmm. for tax rates just to pay for this government at that time. So I try to explain to people in dollars and cents 
just what's going to happen to them if the left gets their way. They produce this equality of outcome agenda where we don't reform entitlements and we stick with these kind of command and control systems. So I try to find a way of, 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 of explaining in dollars and cents what their future will look like from an economic and tax standpoint and how liberty and opportunity will be will be crushed if we stay in this particular path. Okay, so I also, before while well, I had the opportunity, wanted to ask you about sort of the legislative versus executive balance because one of the things sure. that I've been critiquing for a long time in the country, and I was doing it under Bush, I was doing it under Obama, I'm doing it now under the Trump administration, uh, is the is the increasing power of the executive branch, seemingly at the expense of the legislative branch, the growing yeah. bureaucracy, yeah. Uh, and the and the feeling that uh, the legislative branch over the last century and a half really has abdicated its duty to by kicking it over to the yeah. bureaucracy. A good example of this being trade. You know, the president obviously yeah. <laughs> uh, is is pushing a particular agenda on trade. This was not in the purview of the executive branch originally. This is in the purview of the legislative branch. You know, the Speaker of the House. What do you? How do you hope to? Yeah. If you do, hope to reestablish the balance originally drawn. We we did some of we established. I wrote the Trade Promotion Authority Law, which mm -hmm. was to allow us to go get trade agreements, and we brought some of that power back into the legislative branch, but not nearly as much as we'd like. So I can go into the particulars of that, but there's a couple of things that we're trying to do here. Um, that we've passed out of the House. The biggest complaint you'll hear from a House Republican is the Senate filibuster and getting things through the Senate. Um, we have this thing called the RAINS Act, which we think is sort of the catch-all of reclaiming Article I, which is 32 state legislatures do this. You pass a big law, it's vague, and, and then the bureaucracy fills in the details with its rules and regulations. Yep. And that just then happens. And so you end up having all these unelected bu bureaucracies effectively writing the laws we experience. We think that's wrong. So what we're saying with this RAINS Act, which is you pass a law, the rules and regulations get published, and then those rules and regulations come back to Congress for final vote, approval, or amendment before they go into effect so that they're um, consented to by the elected branch of government, the people who are mm -hmm. elected to write mm -hmm. the laws before they go into effect. And that holds us accountable too. So to that end, what we do is we try to, in the bills we pass, since we can't get that through the Senate yet, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we try to do it on an individual basis, on a bill-by-bill -bill basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, I did something else. We have these lawyers called the Legislative Council. It's the Office of Legislative Council. Mm -hmm. This is the actual bill drafters. I used to chair the Ways and Means Committee, which is mostly tax laws and healthcare laws. Tax laws have to be written really tightly, very, very prescriptively. And so I was worried we were writing too vague of a law. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just writing really vague laws right. and giving all this discretion to the bureaucracy, except in tax laws. So what I did was I promoted the guy who was head of the tax law writing department mm -hmm. um, to run the entire legislative council department to train the other lawyers at the Legislative Council, how do you write laws really prescriptively right. so that we can reduce the kind of open-ended discretion we end up getting in the executive branch. So I'm trying to change sort of the culture of the way we legislate here so that we're far more detailed and prescriptive to, to not give all this discretion to the executive branch. I really appreciate you taking the yeah. time. And again, you have one of the hardest jobs in all of America. <laughs> That's what they tell I me. Do not, I do not envy you, <laughs> um, but uh, but I appreciate that you're trying to make philosophical arguments in a time when it seems that a lot of people are caught it's up It's actually in, this in the best politics. part of my day, so thank well, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, you bet.